So some other questions left you could come up to be related to that at the end of my talk. So the problem I'm going to talk about, uh, which I'm going to talk about, is what's called the theta problem. I need swamp now. And this is a joint work with Sergio Cecotti. Uh, based on a paper we came out a month or two ago. So the, I want to, first of all, this, this, there's a mixed audience here, so I'm going to, therefore, <coughs> the bulk of my talk is going to be a review of some related ideas, and at the course, kind of towards the end, I will get to what I want to really say. So, um, so what I'm going to do is first I'm going to have a review of what's the basic idea of the swamp The swamp And then I'm going to give some examples of the swamp land criteria. Examples of swamp land criteria. And uh, then I'm going to say what is what is the data problem. This is probably necessary also for the math audience here, which may not even know what we mean by data problem. And uh, then, and this is basically the, the context I just want to say, I'm going to give you a toy model for theta problem as a, in the context of the bridging Calabia three. So this is going to be the connection with geometry the, towards the end. Of what does this have to do with, with, with geometry? And that's the last, the, the last point. OK. Um, so what is the idea of the swamp land, string swamp land? Very simply put is that theories with and without gravity seem to behave very differently for us. And that's, uh, in a sense, surprising. Because from a physics viewpoint, you would think that if you have a Lagrangian involving some maybe scalar field, some fermion, some gauge field, etc., then uh, you formulate the Lagrangian in a given background with a metric, and then you can say, well, we will couple them to a metric, and you can make the metric also dynamical. And you would think that if you have this reasonable-looking Lagrangian, coupling to gravity should also be reasonable. If you have an effective theory, which is a good, look, good, good theory in terms of all the tests we can put it through, unitarity, etc., you would think that just making the G minu, which already appears in the Lagrangian, making it dynamical, you know, if you integrate over it, should not be such a harmful thing. So this is a theory, if you just view it as a fixed background, it's called field theory, without gravity. But if you, oh, something is missing. Yeah, so if you have it, if you have it without the metric being dynamical, then yeah, you, we say we talk about the theories without gravity, and if you make the metric dynamical, we say we have gravity. Why should something be so dramatically different if you turn on metric? It's a bit bizarre. But what we have discovered is that this is indeed the case, that things which look normal and OK without metric being dynamical suddenly become bad when the metric is made dynamic. So, uh, so, so a technical definition of swamp land would be things which are OK if a theory is OK without dynamical metric, but becomes bad after G is dynamical. These kind of theories we call belonging to the swamp. In other words, they have a good chance of working, but somehow they don't work. Okay, that's the technical definition. It doesn't mean there's no good reason why they don't work, so let's not confuse that. I don't mean that there's a mis mysterious thing that never can be understood. No, I'm not claiming that. I'm saying, look at the dynamical theory. This could have, for any reason, could have worked. For some reason, it doesn't work when it could G. It could be deep reasons, it could be simple reasons, but some reason that we have to understand. <laughs> so this is the definition of what we mean by some. Of course, if something doesn't work in physics, at some point, we have to give an explanation of why. What is the reason? And we have to understand it. So in that sense, I'm not saying 
that there's no good reason that it doesn't work. We, of course, will have to understand it. But this will make it more precise what I mean. So this is unambiguous. The field theory, OK, with G not dynamical, <coughs> make it dynamical doesn't work. I just by definition, all that belongs to the So, Kermit? Yes. So with this definition, you would include anything with a gravitational anomaly in the swamp land? So even if it's obviously inconsistent with you, you, you would include the gravitational anomaly in the swamp land. However, you can make an exception. Look, if I have an argument about the gravitational anomalies, unitarity of that, you could say that I'll make an exception of that. That's up to you. Okay. So I would say that the zero order one is that anomalies, <laughs> gravitational anomalies should be OK. You should take care of that. But then there's no other thing that we know of a priori. But then you can add more and more criteria. And then OK, so uh, that's the basic first statement. <coughs> so now, how do we connect this to geometry? Well, in string theory, what does it mean to have a dynamical metric versus non-dynamical? Dynamical and non-dynamical mean what? It means simply that you make the compactification manifold having finite or infinite volume. So in other words, uh, the dictionary from geometry So we take, uh, let's say, from 10 d, we go down to 4 d with some manifold. So we take our geometry to be something like this, let's say. Then in four dimensions, you get factors involving volume of the manifold times, let's say, the Einstein curvature, R of G, etc. And if the volume is infinite, this corresponds to m Planck squared. So there's, in front of this, there's an m Planck squared. <coughs> That corresponds to m Planck squared being infinite, which means the, the gravity <coughs> is turned up. So volume is a distinction between them. So from mathematical viewpoint, what we are basically saying is, what can you get in four dimension when m is non-compact, which you cannot get when m is compact? What restriction does compactness of m place on things that you get? That's the short kind of a geometric version of saying, what does compactness change in the story? OK, uh, so now I'll give you some examples. <coughs> conjecture, which is the following. Suppose you have a, um, a theory, you compact it with four dimensions, and you have a bunch of scalar fields, and uh, suppose there's no potential for them. This we call the moduli space, and when you have such scalar fields which have no potential in this theory. Yes. In the previous picture, there, that M uh, meant to be a uh, dynamical variable is fixed. And but M is a manifold. But, but, but it's, it's a geometry is fixed, or it's allowed to vary? Well, the geometry of it uh, is, is fixed at one particular point, but the variation of them, the fluctuation, will be fields. So in other words, the degrees of freedom of fluctuation are fields from 40 perspective. You start with a fixed geometry, yes. You go, you expand everything near a fixed background, and those fluctuations will be fields. So um, my question is: so is, is this a case of G mu dynamical, G mu not dynamic, not dynamic? I'm not sure I understand your question. The G mu, if the volume of this is infinite, G mu is not dynamical. Not dynamical. It is infinite. If it's finite, it's dynamical. That's it. Basically, that's what the distinction. Is. Maybe I should give actually just one concrete example here so that you see what I mean. So take, take for example, four dimension. Suppose we go down to six dimension <coughs> instead of four dimension. And then suppose M is a four manifold. Well, four, four manifolds which are richly flat are not too many other than the torus. We have a K3. Well, for K3, you could ask what kind of low energy degrees of freedom you get. And we know sometimes you get gate symmetries. But we know that the rank of that gauge cannot be too big. I don't know, rank 22 or something. So the gauge rule is bounded in rank. However, if you make the four manifold non-compact, you can get AD singularities of R pre rank. So the rank is not bounded if gravity is turned up. But if you bring back the gravity, if you have to fit it into a compact space, you get big restrictions. 
So this kind of shows to you that the phenomena, this gives you a hint that the phenomena of gravity is very restricted. Arbitrary rank, which is infinite number of possibilities, suddenly becomes only finite number of possible ranks. So in some sense, the good theories, and then the ones which have compactness, are measure zero in the space of all possibilities. So compactness has a strong restriction on what we can see in physics. So that's the, that's the concrete example that bear in mind here. So let's go back to the case of the um, distance conjecture. So I'm trying to give you some examples for this criteria. You know, still are some finite topology, though. M is non-compact, could be infinite topology. Infinite topology, yes. Yeah, could be infinite. I infinite mean, number of cycles, for the example. The second penny number could, could be, be as large as it wants. Yeah. Infinite, you've got. It could have also been infinite. I am not even bounding that. It could have. <laughs> so it shows that non-compactness is kind of very crazy. Could be too many. Could be too many. Yeah. Yeah, that's the point. There's no, no there are many field theories, yeah. but they are not good gravity theories. So the good thing is that, and that those theories are called going to swamp them. I would say the things which are kind of nicely packaged into a compact space are much harder, and understanding what are the restrictions are what one would want to say, what one to do. Uh, I think Yao was saying there are lots of examples of non-compact finite volume manifolds. So no, there are no cannot be finite. Oh, you have to ask from Richard Fest, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Cannot be finite. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, <coughs> now, so take a distance distance conjecture is the following: You take a space of a, a space a space uh, like M. You compact by you have some scalar fields with no potential. We call these the moduli of this theory. These fields, for example, could be the moduli of the manifold, which is that manifold, or it could be moduli of fluxes on it, or some degree of freedom on it, which <coughs> comes into the physics, and that's the distance. The distance conjecture says that, well, first of all, there's a metric in this space, and the metric comes from a physical perspective, because you have an action which looks like this. So there's a kinetic term for these scalars, and this gives you a metric on the, just by the fact that you have a gradient square term, gives you a metric on the field space. So this, this space, the marginalized space of this field, comes with the naturally equipped with a metric. This is the metric of phi, not the dynamical metric, but the metric in phi space that I'm talking about on the marginalized space. Um, now, so there's a space here, and then you have some marginalized space, and you have some point in it. And the question is, first of all, what if this space is compact or not? And secondly, if it's not compact, uh, by compact, I mean finite, finite diameter. And if it's not in finite diameter, if you go in large distances away from a given point, what can you say about the physics? So the conjecture here says that uh, effectively, for all the examples, the, the, the situation you end up with is when the diameter is infinite. The only, the only single example which is not like that, that we know is M theory in other dimension, which has no, no scalar field whatsoever. So there's a diameter. And the diameter could be as large as it wants. So the diameter, the claim is the diameter is always infinite. That's the first case. And the second one is that when it's infinite, you can say, suppose I go to a distance from some point P0 to an arbitrary point P, <coughs> such that the distance between them is large, because the diameter is infinite, we can't get to any far, far enough point. It turns out that when this happens, you get some kind of degeneration in the geometry or in the physics, and what that means in physics is that you get light states. And the conjecture is that you get power of light states whose mass goes like e to the minus some constant times the distance. In other words, as you approach, if you get far, far distances, if this becomes very large, you get the power of light states whose mass is set by this for a constant which will depend on the theory you're dealing with. Okay? This is a conjecture, and it is, you know, it's, it's intuition comes from studying Calabria manifold and their marginalized spaces. So typically, when you go to large distances and complex structure or k structure, you get a power of light states. Always this happens. You get some kind of degeneration. Why is this typical from physics? It's not obvious. If you just didn't know where they come from, and then you just said abstract this problem, you have just a bunch of scalars, why should it be that you get a tower of light states when you go far away? It's bizarre. But it seems to be the case. So this is a kind of a criteria which is called the distance conjecture. This is something we conjecture with Dugurie about, I guess, 10 years ago or so. There's another one. I'll just give you two more. So, so, so when you say get a, a, 
tar. Nice state. These are nice states in the effective theory, expanding the, the, the value of that. That's right. Well, at, at that particular point. As you go along, you just take geometry, and that's what you get. <coughs> Another one which uh, has been studied quite a bit is, uh, quite a bit, is called the weak gravity conjecture. This is something I uh, conjecture with a group here at Harvard, uh, again about 10 years ago, which is that the statement states that uh, in any theory of quantum gravity, if you have charged particles, let's for simplicity talk about the U1 gauge theory, first of all, you do have charged particles. Let's take the elementary charge excitation called Q. Uh, so you have a particle of charge Q. The question is, what do you know about its mass? And uh, the same thing here is that the mass is always less than or equal to Q for the elementary excitation or an excitation which is sufficiently elementary, namely when we talk about uh, M naught being of the order of M Planck. So for, for of the order of one charges, there are states whose mass is less than their charge. What does that have to do with weak gravity? Well, it has to do with weak gravity because the force between the light objects goes like m squared over r squared, let's say, to give it four dimension, versus q squared over r squared. So if m is less than q, this is less than that. So that means the gravitational attraction is smaller than electric repulsion. So electric repulsion will always win the gravitational attraction, except <coughs> for a special case when it's equal. And when it's equal, it actually corresponds to BPS states. So BPS states that uh, we're familiar with in the context of string theory, like special uh, calibrated geometries or things having to do with some special aspects of, uh, of the submanifolds, which are interesting for uh, preserving some supersymmetry, then you get equalities. And otherwise, you get the weak, weak gravity conjecture says that the mass should be less, strictly less than Q. Again, there's no proof of these. We have examples. Interesting examples of this would be to try and study in K3 case. This is a good problem for, I have recommended, actually in my previous talk here I, I gave a few years ago, or maybe last year, where I suggested studying this example in the context of K3. In the context of K3, this Q would correspond to the homology lab charge choice in the K3. And if you know that the self-intersection is the wrong sign, typically you will not have any holomorphic object, so you cannot satisfy the equality. The question is that does that the area of that object is it less than related to some uh, captured by charge, if you try to do this get charge. So that would be an extremely interesting question, actually, to settle the using geometry. It's strict inequality that has to be true. Um, other example, so this is, this is another example of this strong band criteria. Another example is that every parameter in the Lagrangian is vacuum expectation value of some field. That means there is no free parameter in string theory. In other words, if I have a Lagrangian like this, and if I have a potential, suppose you have V of phi here, which is non-trivial, and suppose V of phi is at alpha phi squared, plus beta phi to the fourth, etc. These parameters, we usually think, in field theory, it's just some numbers, coupling constants, masses. But in string theory, we cannot view them as frozen. That alpha is somehow the equation value of some other field. Beta is the equation value of yet another field, etc. So there are no parameter that appears in the Lagrangian is completely frozen. What does that mean? That means you can vary them by some dynamical process. In other words, if you want to change alpha, well, all you have to do is excite this field, other field phi, away from its minimum, so you can vary it. So it's not, not frozen. You can, in principle, vary everything. There's nothing which is frozen. Of course, at the minimum, there might be frozen, but it's not frozen for arbitrary high energy. You can always get rid of, you can always get out of the minimum by, by doing some energy in the game. This is, what does this mean? That means that you don't have an a priori frozen parameter in the theory. All these parameters in the context of string theory relate to some aspect of geometry. Geometry, for example, Ricci flat, you can always go away from Ricci flatness, and you can change parameters. Well, that corresponds to going in the massive directions. So those are the kind of things that you can, in principle, measure from how the potential changes and so on. So, uh, now, finally, I'll give you one more example, and before I go to, 
and what the problem is. <clears throat> so, Cameron, I have a dumb question, which I should know the answer. To. <coughs> so, for your combining those last two, for your weak con gravity conjecture, do you want to say that um, because those parameters, the, the charge is fixed, but the mass will be something that varies? Do you want to say in vacuum that should be true, or that it should be true for all values of these varying? Uh, so I didn't quite understand. So, so you're the, ma the mass in the weak gravity conjecture, yes. of course, is parameters, so that will be determined by Bess. Yes. So do you want to say that that's true in vacuum, that m is less than q for these things, or that it's true for all possible values of the vector? Well, people have tried to extend it away from vacuum configuration. So there are very various versions of the weak gravity condition. This, the most conservative one is that you're at the mm. particular stable stationary situation. But people have talked about some very different versions of this. So, so there, are, there are variations. Also for the distance conjecture, there are variations. So I assume the v was 0, but people have actually considered a situation where v is not strictly 0. So there are, there are various, various variations. And finally, the other example I want to mention is the descender condition, which we recently suggested here with, uh, with Georges and a few others, with Hiroshi and his student as well. Uh, and what we basically conjectured there was that the, um, the descender space may not exist in the context of a quantum theory of gravity. And this would, of course, have dramatic ramification if it's true. Uh, so those are the kind of conditions that one has to study. For example, the bound of the form that the gradient of the potential field is always bounded by some constant time. The potential uh, is the kind of conjecture that we made, and that kind of thing that people are uh, debating quite, uh, quite, uh, quite a lot these days. So I won't talk about this aspect in this talk. So just I'll bring up one last condition that people are studying. The main point is that the, these conditions actually have a lot to do with predicting things about physics. They are not just you know, boring statements, and they could have impact in what we think about the actual universe. So it's non-trivial statements. And it's great because these would be, if we can narrow down the space of possibilities in string theory, the more predictive we can make string theory. Otherwise, we have nothing to say. So I think understanding the, the swampland condition is exactly what we should do in the context of string theory in trying to connect it with reality. With, with, with distribution that we can have. So instead of draining the swamps of the stream, we want to expand the swamp in the sense that in the sense that the bigger the swamp is, the smaller the islands of landscape are. And that's great because that can be very predictive then. So we want to basically clean up the landscape is the question. So um, so this then move on. So this is so far as background of what the motivation of the swampland is. So what I want to now say is what is the theta problem? So what is the theta problem? Well, um, it started with QCD, understanding of QCD in the 70s, 1970s. Well, people zoomed in into the theory of strong interaction in terms of SU3 gauge theory. With the Lagrangian, which had the gauge field, uh, uh, SU3 connection, <coughs> with some uh, yeah, Mills connection squared, curvature squared. And then they discovered that uh, there's an extra term that they had missed before that should be added to this. And this was the theta term, which was a topological term. A term like this, i theta times f wedge f. This is a very nice object, mathematically, of course. It's a second term class. And there's a parameter that goes with it, which is a periodic variable. It's periodic because it's always with suitable normalization that I haven't been careful about. The integral of this is an integer, so therefore uh, theta can only be defined mod 2 pi. Doesn't affect the action when you take into account that this is action uh, always exponentiated in the path of the road, so therefore theta is between 0 and 2 pi. Okay, now, a priori, you could have any uh, kind of value for theta. But then they, they did experiments, and they find in experiments, theta not being zero violates <coughs> CP, or time reversal invariance. Time reversal invariance gets violated in strong interactions. But there were strong bounds that this CP is not violated in strong interactions. And the bounds, I think, currently is of the order of 10 to the minus 10 for this angle. So this angle, which is between 0 and 2 pi, is so close to 0. <coughs> up to 10 digits at least, that people believe it has to be somehow zero. So it's theta equal to zero is the, is, the, is the suspicion. OK, 
Okay, but then the question is why? Why should it be zero? What's the explanation of that? Because a priori, the, the motivation of field theory is that whenever you have parameters, they take generic values. And why should it have picked like this kind of a situation? Well, um, a good explan one explanation of it which has been offered is, to, is the following idea, is to promote this to a field. More precisely, you can view theta just like these as the expectation value of some field. <coughs> so you now think about theta as the vacuum expectation value of some field, and then you say, oh, what has happened maybe is that we have some, some theta as a field, and the minimum of the potential maybe is at zero. There's some potential as a function of theta, and you find that you should find that at theta equal to zero, it wants to be a minimum. Now, maybe that's not that strange, you might think. In fact, um, if you just literally take QCD with theta angle and promote this to a parameter with no other thing in the game, if you just study this model by itself, it is not hard to prove that theta equal to zero has the lowest amount of energy. So then any, any amount of things you can take gets the energy up because of the phase, because of the positivity of the action. But now this e to the i theta introduces the phase into the action. So phase makes it smaller, basically, and it makes the energy higher. So you can kind of argue why you could have something like this. So the idea is not that unreasonable anymore, that you can imagine this is a dynamical field and somehow theta equal to zero is picked out because that's the case where it has the smallest phase variation, which means the largest energy. The argument was something like if you take some kind of integral, for example, you will get this is e to the minus the energy. And when theta is not zero, this, this is going to be interfering with each other. The plus or minuses will have phases in them. And this is going to get smaller. That means energy is going to go higher. So the energy is going to be higher when theta is not zero. It's a very simple argument. This is not, of course, not a proof that this will always happen because it depends on exactly what kind of matter you have and so on, whether it's positive or not. But at least gives you the idea that's not a strange thing to do. And this is idea was introduced by Peche, Peche Quinn to, to try to argue that this kind of thing could happen with some potential like this. And it's called the Peche Quinn mechanism uh, of trying to get the, the theta to explain why it's zero. And this particle itself, this theta having this property, which also was suggested by Uche, is called axion. And the properties that this particle has, uh, namely this field, which is now going to have some massive excitations, is corresponds to a particle that, in principle, you can excite the QCD vacuum and observe this particle as an axion. So the axion is really exciting mathematically. It's precisely the term which controls the topological term. And the dynamics of that term, controlling the topological term, is the axion, which is very nice. So I think it should be interesting for mathematicians as well, because it's the closest you come to topology. And it's one of the hot, hot debated things about what properties this axion has. So uh, what are the properties we think? Well, we don't really know much. We, we, there, are, there are strong bounds experimentally about what kind of masses it could have. But let me just not get too much into it. I'll just say uh, how, how this parameterize it. So, so if you want to write the Lagrangian for the state angle, you have something like a kinetic term and some potential term. And the potential term, let me just zoom to theta near zero and ignore the constant, so you get something like, uh, like m squared theta squared. Now, um, but if theta is dimensionless, this cannot make sense. So the thing that you're going to have in dimension is going to be something which is fourth in, uh, in energy scale, because the dimension of this is dimension four. So if this is dimensionless, you have none of the fourth here. This is dimension two, so you need some dimension two quantity here. And that's called the F of the theta. So in other words, if you want to parameterize it this way, so the mass squared is going to be lambda to the fourth over F squared. In other words, the mass will be parameterized by lambda squared over F. And depending on what are the dynamics which creates this potential, and what determines the kinetic term of F, of theta, you can get different kinds of masses for the axiom. And you know, people have gone from very small to very large masses because we really don't know exactly what's causing this, what's lambda, what's f. And then there are various string models, for example, some of them we studied in the F theory context with Jonathan and company, gave you an interesting range of 10 to 10, 12 or so GeV. And that's actually one of the ranges of wind, one of the very narrow windows which are still not experimentally ruled out for axion. So that's one of the 
interesting area potentially to connect with FBIR. Since we're an FBIR workshop, I think I should mention that. Any questions? <coughs> oh, I have only 10 minutes. OK. <laughs> Okay. Okay, 10 minutes. Okay, um, fine. So, good. I'm going to go over my contacts. <laughs> Context of now we want to think about this in the context of string theory. What is the axiom? Well, there are in the context of Calabi-Yau cases, for example, we are familiar with Beamy and New, the anti-symmetric field, complex numbers. Those are the kind of periodic variables that we get. Are, uh, for example, in large Kähler class moduli, you get these B fields and so on. Those angles, those periodic variables become theta angles. And so to get the potential for them means that you are freezing some moduli and Kähler classes and so on. And the question is, what value does it freeze it at? That's the question. Why would it? What? what why should the angle that it freezes the beam to be at zero or pi or whatnot? What? What are the choices? <laughs> <coughs> so let's talk about a baby version of the theta angle problem. You see, the theta angle was originally phrased in the context of QCD, but also there are other theta angles for QED or even electroweak cases. And in fact, if these guys get unified, which we believe they do, the theta angle starts life being one theta angle if there's a simple unified group. So you have theta times f by f, where f is SU5 or SO10 or something. So there's some natural theta angle corresponding to overall group. But then, of course, it breaks, and then this theta can have different theta angles by the time it gets down to our energy scale. So there would be some theta angle also for QED. So you have theta f by f where f is literally, literally the purpose of the one gauge piece for the photon. So if you want to parameterize it like this, you can have, you will have a term like this. So this is just the, the U1 part of the standard model, the gauge piece part, because of whatever else there is. And in this context, it's natural to define um, a corresponding tau, a complex parameter which combines these two together. We combine the E and the theta. And the reason this is natural is that it turns out that the changing the electric and magnetic duality, the electromagnetic duality, exchanging them, corresponds to transformation involving tau. And in fact, these kind of shifts between the electric and magnetic frames corresponds to an SL2Z action on tau. In other words, we can, roughly speaking, think about tau as if it's a complex moduli of a torus. That's a general statement about just the properties of the electric and magnetic frames. So we have, in the actual universe, in the one we live in, a particular complex structure picked out. You, you compute the fine structure constant, you compute the theta angle, and there is a tau. There's a fixed torus, which is experimentally measured. Uh, this could be measured. We haven't measured the theta angle yet for the QED, but, uh, but certainly there is this fine structure constant we have measured. It's about 100, 1 over 137. So this tau we know has a huge imaginary part, uh, which is 100, around 137. And then there's some, uh, some uh, real piece, which is not determined yet. OK, so that's the question for the, for the uh, experimentalist to say, determine this. But the question is, could it be that this beta angle, just like you see, is frozen to some particular values, like zero? Could there be some reason for that? Or is it, in fact? Well, um, what kind of model can we build in string theory like this? Because in string theory, anytime we get this, this is going to be the moduli of some field, the excitation value of some field, you would think. And therefore, why would it have to be frozen? Well, do you think that if you have to fro freeze everything, freeze things, it's going to be a very difficult model to deal with because modular stabilization is one of the biggest difficult things in string theory. So we are out of luck in trying to give a model to even mimic this kind of situation. But let's think about it. In our universe, in the deep infrared, if you go to the lowest energy scale, the only massless objects we believe we have 
is the graviton and the photon. Right? So in the deep infrared, when you integrate out even the neutrinos, everything, you have an effective theory only involving G mu nu and A mu, nothing else. So the lightest degrees of freedom are just the graviton and the photon. So the Lagrangian we know for them is you know the usual Einstein term and then plus the F squared term and then F which F term. So so this is the kind of term we have, the leading Lagrangian in the universe, we can come write it like this, and this is the effective theory. Is there any theory which we know which looks like this? Well, to be honest, we do not know if it's exactly this theory we're dealing with because it's possible that neutrinos, at least some of them, are massless. It hasn't been ruled out. You know, even though there's a difference of <coughs> masses, m squared for neutrinos, it hasn't been ruled out that some of them might be massless. It could have been that there are a few masses fermions in this game too. And in fact, interestingly enough, if you add a couple more masses fermions here, this is exactly the same multiplet as an n equal to 2 supergravity, pure supergravity. So n equal to 2 pure supergravity has a graviton, a photon, and then some, a bunch of fermions, a couple of fermions. Gravitinos, basically, in that context. Well, the neutrino is not supposed to be gravitino, but then yeah, I'm just trying to misuse the, trying to <coughs> guide your thinking into thinking that this is not too far from what we have if you think about n equal to supergravity. At any rate, ignoring the fermion aspect, the bosonic part of pure n equal to supergravity is nothing but the graviton and the photon. Okay? Now, in that context, you could say if you take n equal to supergravity, what is the theta angle for n equal to supergravity? The n equal to supergravity, pure supergravity, has no scalar field. Therefore, the theta angle should be some value. It's, it's not, it, there's no field in the Lagrangian for that scalar field. So you cannot say it's an arbitrary value. It has to have some value. What is it? Does quantum gravity tell you what value it is? Not a priori. It doesn't look like it. In fact, you might ask, does even theta show up in any computation in four dimensions? Or is it because it's total derivative, it's topological, maybe it's irrelevant? That's not true. Let me just make sure that that's clearly, explain why that's not true. For example, you might ask, um, what is the number of black, what is the entropy of a black hole of a given electric and magnetic charge? And it goes, the number of, the number of, uh, the number of black holes of a given uh, electromagnetic charge, if you take P and the Q to be electric and magnetic, grows exponentially in this form, P plus Q tau over tau 2, P plus Q tau squared over tau 2. So it certainly depends on the theta angle. So this is the, just the, the extremal uh, black hole entropy of a given electric and magnetic charge using just this action. So certainly the theta angle will show up in, in physical quantities. If you want to measure the entropy of a charged black hole in our universe, it will depend on the theta angle. Okay, so that's a very concrete statement. That is not just a random statement. Theta angle is physically measurable <coughs> in the context of gravity, and so we cannot ignore it. <coughs> Okay, good. So how do we model this? Well, if we have a model for n equal to square gravity, then we can at least see what theta angles we get. So what are n equal to super gravity models that we know? Well, it turns out we do not know how to obtain n equal to pure super gravity in string theory. It is possible that n equal to super gravity just doesn't exist as a consistent theory. N equal to pure supergravity is not obtainable by M theory or, or string theory or F theory or whatnot. We have no idea whether it exists. At least all the indications are is that N equal to pure supergravity just does not exist, or we are incompetent in getting it, at least up to now, one or the other. At any rate, we have no way to get pure N equal to supergravity with present day technology of string theory. So, what do we do? Well, it turns out we can get something as good for our problem. And what is as good as the following? You take type 2b string theory on original Malavia <coughs> three poles. So if you take the rigid Calabia, Calabia three folds, there are cater structure and complex structures in general, but for the rigid one, there is no complex structure. It's, there's no module for that by definition, but there's of course scalar class. 
the Kähler class for the Calabria and so on will determine the number of hypermultiplets. So the number of vector multiplets is determined by the number of complex structure of this Calabria, which we are taking to be rigid. In other words, there are no vector multiplets in this theory. So the number of vector multiplets is equal to zero in this case. Now, of course, this is in addition to the gravity multiplet. The gravity multiplet has, of course, a photon. In addition to the photon, this theory has no other gauge field, in other words. So there, in this theory, we have no other gauge field other than the photon. There are hyper multiplets, but it turns out, you can argue, by the decoupling between the vector and the hypers, that these parameters that appear here, the tau, is independent of hyper multiplets. In other words, the Kähler moduli does not con control the complex structure aspects of complex structure, there's a splitting in the case of Calabria 3 fold. Therefore, for the problem that we are dealing, this is good enough. So the rigid Calabria 3 folds. so the statement is that if you study the type to be on a rigid Calabria, it should give you a particular tau, and what is it? <laughs> so now we are translated to a toy model in the concept of Calabria and asking, what kind of things do we get from Calabria? These are frozen, now there is no moduli for them. Well, what is the tau? Let's just actually try to understand what is geometric to this tau in the context of Calabria. Well, a rigid Calabria has, has H3 0 and H, the dimension of them is equal to 1. So you have 1 H3 and 1 H3 0, and no other three-dimensional cycle. So there's, we can choose a, uh, a so for three-dimensional cycles in general, we can choose the pair. The canonical pair with intersection is, uh, is 1. So you can take a symplectic basis for them. And um, then you can, for example, normalize the holomorphic three form to be 1 over one of them, and the integral over the other one is exactly what the tau is. In other words, the same way you define the tau for the case of the torus, for this two-dimensional homology in the mid-dimension here, is exactly how you define the tau. And of course, this is only well defined up to SL2C, which is correct. That's the way the tau should be transforming. So, so you take a rigid Calabria, you take the ratio of some B cycle over the period of B over A, and that's your tau. And the question is, what do you get for these guys? OK, that's the question. Now, the very fact that they are frozen doesn't mean there are no fields corresponding to them. Because if you try to solve the Bertrami differential, Bertrami, the Bertrami differential or Bertrami equation to give, to give you the Bertrami differential, the fact that there are no solutions for a rigid Calabria there's no harmonic ones. Doesn't mean that there are no massive uh, excitations. So if you look at the, that, that problem, the spectrum of the Laplacian will be will have massive ones. So those will be corresponding to the masses of the axions or whatnot. So you have a similar story as the usual axion story, where the mass of the axion is, scale, is set by the calusa klein scale or the size of the Calabria. <coughs> Therefore, the value, the mass looks very much like the axion problem. Except now the tau is frozen, and we want to know what the values are. Okay. Now, what are the what are the known rigid Calabrias? There are about fifty or so rigid Calabria three folds known. Okay. And all of them, all of them, gives you theta is equal to zero or five. Why should it have been is unclear. Well. In fact, even why one of them even has about 0 or pi is strange, perhaps, from the physics viewpoint. But all of the known ones have either theta equal to 0 or pi. And interestingly enough, theta 0 or pi preserves time reversal, CP invariant. There is a very no reason why it had to be like this. Just to, just to make it clear that this is a, might be a gravity problem, just take, for example, uh, n equals to 4 Yang mills, there's a tau, there's, tau could be any value, there's no reason it should be particular value. You can geometrically engineer, and then it goes to 4 if you don't have a gravity with any value of theta you want. There's nothing a priori from the non-gravitational sector which tells you what theta should be. 
supersymmetry is not going to determine that for you. That's the main point I'm trying to make. N equals to 4 is a good example to see. It does not determine the theta angle. Therefore, this is strange that somehow the gravity, when you bring it to the mix, all the examples that we know give you 0 pi. It doesn't prove that there is no possible way of getting other than 0 pi. So first of all, it would be interesting to see if you can ever get any other value other than 0 pi. For example, this pi is already bizarre, because usually you would think that the minimum of the potential is that the argument I gave you sounded like such so a thing equal to 0 is always the minimum. So it's not equal to pi. The pi is going to be the maximal phase variation. So you would be surprised why pi is picked out there. But it is in that case. And this pi is exact, an example of this is, certain, is very simple. is the z-manifold. The z-manifold gives you theta equals to pi. That's the t6 mod out by z3 when t is, uh, t2s have hexagonal symmetry. Yes? I have a question. Uh, the theta there, and actually I think of, of it as the real part of the tau. Like it's, yes. It's it's more generally, the other way of saying is that the g of tau is real. OK. And the more invariant the statement, the j function. So it's not explained. It's, it's not explained why. So I'm running out of time. I have run out of time. I understand. But let me just give you a few more. So first of all, it would be very interesting from Calabria perspective to understand whether there are other values or not. We don't know. We conjecture that there are not, but maybe we are wrong. Regardless, the fact that there is on, that there are even one of them, which is zero or pi, is already such surprising because we expect there are only finite number of Calabrias and therefore finite number of rigid Calabrias. Therefore, the probability in that space to have any of them being zero should have been measure zero unless it's special, and we are saying that, well, at least one of them, or in fact all of them, is either zero or pi. That's bizarre. Okay, so this is already extremely strange, and it suggests that maybe there's a gravitational solution to picking out these values, the zero or pi. And it'd be interesting to understand why, to understand what is the mechanism to, to pick these values. First, mathematically understand them better, and perhaps translate that to a physical constraint. What is, what is happening? So it's an interesting connection, perhaps, between geometry and questions of interest in phenomenology. Uh, I should just add one thing before I finish. If you did the rigid, if you did instead of the rigid Calabria, the general Calabria, and ask whether or not time reversal is broken or not, whether you are always theta equals zero pi, in that case you have you have these CIJK, which you usually get, you know, in the context of uh, in the context of uh, topological string you are familiar with, and the quantum corrections and so on. The statement in the case of theta zero pi amount to saying whether CIJKs are real or not. Well, there's always a sub-locus if you restrict to the real instanton locus that's always real. So there's always a sub-locus where time reversal is preserved, even though, again, from the n equal to 2 point of view, it didn't have to be the case. So from the supergravity viewpoint, it is not obvious why you should always end up with a locus which preserves time reversal. And here, the rigid case seems to see also that. And that aspect is very strange, and it needs to be better understood. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, sorry. So, so the the real part is fixed to zero or pi, basically. But the imaginary part, the actual gauge coupling itself, does that just you know vary around randomly? Do you get something like? Well, good question. So I was going to say something about it, but I decided not to say. Uh, so, so the very good question is, what do we know about the fine structure constant itself in this kind of models? Well. It's predicted somehow. There are at least finite number of lists of them. What special things they have? So, uh, if you look at the J function, for the non so many of the non examples are complex multiplication, <coughs> and for those ones, J is rational. Now, that's not always the case, and in fact, uh, I was talking with the Danzig just recently. He claims that generally there's no reason J should be rational or even K extension of rationals. <coughs> so, he in fact thinks that that's. He said he has the multiple conjecture that is actually exactly conjecture counter to this conjecture. It would have been countered the statement that J is rational. So, so the statement is that it's an interesting question mathematically. What do we know about the J of the house for the actual J? Not just the reality property, but whether it's rational, whether it's K extension of rationals or not. Zaygi claims that the natural conjecture is typically not rational. And uh, I'm happy with that. I agree it's not rational. I expect it to be algebraic. No, no, no. no he, he, he thinks it's he, not. He, he believes that at least he, he claims that this would be against some other conjecture, right? 
This is against Greg Moore conjecture, is that on the... Is it it's not related to the Greg conjecture. No, it is, not, because these Ridley guys are also attractor. So. Oh, no, sorry, but you're not... No, no, this, this doesn't... This doesn't yeah, yeah, okay. Greg studies some algebraic uh, number three aspects of, uh, of black hole, but this does not uh, lead to the condition that he's talking about. Yeah, okay. At any rate, I think that it would be extremely interesting to study... It's an interplay between number three type of questions, uh, geometry, and phenomenology at the same time. So I think it, it is, it's an interesting... Uh, Set of circle by the <coughs> uh, Let's wait the speaker again. Thank <laughs> you.